Hi, I'm Jonathan Ayers and I'm the author of five books of fiction and non-fiction. By day I'm a commissioning editor for Bloomsbury Publishing and by night I'm an editor and mentor for creative writers with the Cornerstones Literary Consultancy and Write Mentor. So I've worked with writers at all different levels of ability and uh, you know where they are in their careers uh, who are at all different stages with their books and I found uh, a lot of things I'm saying to them wherever they are uh, there are a lot of recurring issues and things that come up time and time again so in this video I'm going to tackle some of the really big things things that come up a lot that I find myself kind of explaining and discussing with writers at all different levels and a lot of the times when we begin discussing it, it, it you know, it clicks immediately. You think, oh, yeah, yeah, that sounds really obvious. But some of this stuff isn't obvious unless somebody's pointed it out to you. So in this video, we're tackling, you know, half a dozen kind of issues. And a lot of them are kind of in interconnected. Uh, some of them are going to be big issues about, you know, structure. And some of them are going to be really uh, kind of what might seem like a minor issue but it's going to be really getting into the nitty-gritty. Uh, but I think you're going to find this, wherever you are in your writing career, I think you're going to find it useful. I think I'm going to aim this at kind of writers who are not necessarily beginners, so writers who have maybe already finished a first draft. So people who have got to the end of something, know something isn't working, and they're looking back and trying to find out what, it, what, is it, what is it that isn't working for them, or maybe if they started submitting to agents, why are they getting rejected? However, if you are a beginner, uh, if you haven't finished your first draft of anything, whether you're just starting out, I think you're still gonna find stuff here that is useful to you. It might be stuff that you haven't actually encountered yet, but you might encounter it later down the road. So I think you're gonna get some useful stuff here to bear in mind as you dive into your first draft. I think it's worth pointing out up front that the kind of things I'm gonna bring up are stuff that's probably more relevant to the kind of commercial end of fiction, whether that's adult or children's, because I think the, the similarities are, are greater than the differences. Some of the stuff I'm going to say is going to be less relevant if you are writing really experimental or literary fiction, but you know, pay attention, it might be useful to you too. So the first issue I'm going to tackle is one that might not actually seem that important, but it is the one that straight away, when I encounter it in a book, is the one that says to me, this is not going to work. And it might not actually seem that big of a deal when I tell you what it is, but it is kind of that, uh, it is the bottom card in the house of cards that is your novel. And once that card is missing, the rest of it will tumble down. And that issue is having a reactive main character. So we should probably start off by exploring what is a reactive character and what is a reactive plot, because the two of them always go hand in hand. Uh, a plot needs to be driven by the main character. Uh, you know, it's not about things happening around them or to them. It needs to be happening because of them. Uh, the character needs to be in the driving seat and not the passenger seat. Now, to complicate things a little bit further, it is perfectly acceptable for a, a novel to begin reactively. That's to say, for a character to be dragged into a situation completely against their will, where they have no control over what's happening to them, and then the story follows what happens next. The key there, though, is that the story, the plot, is about what they do to get out of this situation. It's not about what happens, it's about what they do to counteract what is happening. I think a really good example here is actually the film Alien. Now if I asked you to describe the plot of Alien, you'd probably say it's about a bunch of astronauts 
on a spaceship who are being picked off one by one by an alien. That is not the plot of Alien. The plot of Alien is a bunch of astronauts are stuck on a spaceship, they're being picked off one by one, and they're trying to stop that from happening. And that is the key difference, that the, the story follows what they are doing to try to stop this reactive situation. So they are all proactive characters. And I'm going to get a bit literary here, because E.M. Forster, who wrote uh, Passage to India, and A Room with a View, and most importantly, aspects of the novel, sum this up really well. And if you haven't heard of aspects of the novel, it's a kind of collection of uh, transcripts of lectures he gave about all the important stuff that goes into the construction of a novel. If you can read one book, uh, A Creative Writing Guide, then, then read Stephen King's On Writing. If you're going to read two books that are kind of creative writing guides, then read Stephen King's On Writing and read E.M. Forster's Aspects of the Novel. So in Aspects of the Novel, E.M. Forster gives a really good uh, kind of definition of that difference between plot and story. Because, you know, we, we could all kind of use it, those words kind of interchangeably, but there is a difference. And uh, he really kind of sums it up. And this ties into what I'm saying about the difference between a kind of proactive protagonist who drives a kind of active storyline and a reactive protagonist who gets stuck in a reactive storyline. And his definition is uh, a story is the king died, uh, then the queen died. A plot is the king died and then the Queen died of a broken heart. So basically what Forster is saying here about plot is the plot is about consequence. It is about not just one thing happening after another, it is about one thing happening because of another. And it needs to be your protagonist who is making one thing happen because of another. They are the because. And that is how they become a proactive protagonist rather than a reactive protagonist. And how your plotline becomes an active plot rather than a reactive plot. So I'm going to broaden things out now and talk about what is a plot. And basically it's all about your protagonist having agency. And kind of agency means that they have a degree of power within the confines of the story to affect changes within it. It doesn't mean that uh, they can solve all their problems instantly, but it means they have the ability to try. It is absolutely crucial that as soon as possible your main character gets a goal. Now as I was saying before, they can be dragged into this, uh, this storyline reactively but pretty soon they have to develop a sense of agency. They need a goal, and the goal can be uh, one of two things. Either they want to get out of this situation as quickly as possible, perfectly valid, or it can be something else. They want to solve a greater problem. Uh, and now we're really getting into the nitty gritty of where plots can go. But in a nutshell, uh, you know, every story has to revolve around the main character having goals, uh, making several attempts to achieve those goals, failing, uh, making mistakes, paying the price of those mistakes, learning from those mistakes, trying again, and making that, you know, that final discovery, that final growth of their personality that enables them to succeed in their goals at the very end. Now the goals can change throughout and usually the, the best plots are ones that have a multi-goal structure. So at the beginning uh, either the character either has a goal right from the start or from before the start or they develop a goal pretty quickly. But somewhere along the road during the story something more important comes up 
and that becomes the goal. And that those are sometimes the most interesting plot lines where the goals evolve and they become focused on something else that wasn't that important to them at the beginning, but they realise this is actually more important than them now. Before I get ahead of myself though, I think we need to strip it back to the, vo the, the most basic levels. And that is the fact that there really are only two different plot lines in existence. And the plot lines are, one, your main character is trying to get something, or two, your main character already has something and they're trying to protect it. They're trying to stop somebody else from getting it. Either way, uh, the dramatic tension comes from the chances that they might not succeed, that they might fail, that they might not get what they want, or that they might lose what they've already got. And it's somebody else who, because they're not the main character, who will get what the main character has, and we will not want them to get it. By way of a minor digression here, uh, many a good story is made by a good villain. By villain, we don't necessarily mean a, a monster or somebody who is evil. Uh, you know, a, a, probably better to call them an antagonist rather than a villain. Uh, you know, we have a protagonist who is a hero and the uh, a villain who is an antagonist. An antagonist usually it's a case of their goals clash with the protagonists. Doesn't mean they're bad or they've got bad mot motivations, but we don't want them to succeed because we've seen what the protagonist wants and why they want it. And we're on board with that. Uh, we don't want what the antagonist wants. Uh, they're not necessarily a monster, but they are the main source of dramatic tension that we don't want them to succeed. And uh, you know, a key thing to remember about all stories is that uh, you're telling one story about your main character and it is really just their story, however many characters there are in it. But uh, you know, an important thing to remember when you're writing subsidiary characters, including the antagonist, is that every character in your story is the main character in their own novel. Not the novel you're writing, but it's the novel they're living in. So, you know, they're all going to see things differently. And the, the best villains, or the best antagonists, who don't have to be evil, uh, are the ones who have perfectly kind of noble goals. They're not, you know, evil Blofeld or Voldemort or Darth Vader characters but people who just see things differently from your protagonist and who want the same thing and they will do something different with it. The way this feeds back into uh, you know, your protagonists, your proactive main character's story, is that they need somebody who's going to be their foil uh, at every step of the way. Somebody who's going to hinder them, who's going to kind of create more obstacles that they have to overcome, who is going to be that character who forces them to grow, who, who makes them learn, and who ultimately actually helps them uh, kind of rise to that level where at the end they are able to succeed in a way that they couldn't have done when they were that person they were right at the beginning. Whether that was a beginning where they were a proactive character who already had a, had a mission, who already had a goal, or somebody who reactively was dragged into this scenario that they had to overcome. So what we're coming to now are what I call the three C's of fiction, and this is probably the most important one, which is conflict. And by conflict, I don't mean uh, everyone having fisty cuffs. Uh, it's, it's not about a... Uh, Hollywood star movie where everyone has a fight at the end and it's you know whoever's strongest wins. Conflict is simply about those kind of clash of what people are, uh, what they want and what they're trying to achieve and uh, in how they're going to go about it. So the three C's of fiction and conflict is the most important one but it's the middle one. Uh, the first one 
is character. Conflict is the middle one. Choices is the third one. So character, uh, you know, we covered them in, in uh, beyond the sense of them being a proactive character. You need somebody who is imperfect, they're flawed, and preferably flawed in a way that the story that you've got in mind will seriously challenge them. That it is going to be the, uh, it's gonna, the problem they've got, they cannot succeed unless they overcome this personal flaw. So really, when you think about it, the, the kind of the best person to, uh, to be your protagonist is actually the worst person that you want in the situation you've created. And to use another example from film, uh, if you think about Jaws, the main character in the film is the, 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 the police chief, Brody, who is uh, scared of water. He's a, he's a city cop transplanted to a kind of a very sleepy island. He is used to shooting at gangsters. You cannot shoot at a shark. And he's caught in a situation where he cannot go into the water. And that's actually a pretty uh, good thing if there's a killer shark in the water, but he is, he is terrified of the sea. Is he the best person to be going up against a shark? The key point here is that Jaws is not about somebody going up against a shark, not really. It is about one bloke going up against everybody else, all the other humans, not the shark, the shark is just doing his own thing. Uh, Jaws is about Brody going up against all the people who are not listening to him. And that's what the story is about. And he does it very well. If we, if we extrapolate that one, on a more wide basis, then you're kind of looking for that kind of Brody character in your story. So you, you've got a concept of the world you're writing about, and the world is kind of against your main character. You know, that you can write a story where the world isn't against your main character, you're making it too easy for your main character. Uh, not everybody has to be against your main character. It, it's always good to have certain other characters who are on your main character's side. But generally, your character has to have a goal. Uh, but, you know, not everyone who is against your main character has to be the villain. Uh, there are a lot of people who can hinder your main character and stop them achieving their goal. Not through malice, but simply through just having different goals. And this is, this is how we... Uh, yeah, Going back to my previous point about how not every villain, not every antagonist, is a monster. It's your main character making a choice is that distinguishing factor between you having a reactive plotline and a reactive protagonist uh, and a proactive protagonist in a an active plotline. That you give your character a choice and they make a choice, and it might be the wrong choice, but that is fine. But the key point is they make that choice and then they deal with the consequences. So we, we sympathise with a character who makes a decision, who acts on that decision, it's the wrong decision, and then they, they have to deal with those consequences. Uh, that is better than a character who doesn't have to make that decision, who uh, just can just float through a story and things happen to and around them. Uh, they never have to make that decision, they never have to deal with anything. Uh, always put that, always put your main character, your protagonist, in that position where they are the ones that have to make the decision. And it's even better, it's for drama's purpose, you know, dramatic tension and all the, the juicy stuff that you get to write about. It's always better if there is a no-win scenario where they have to make a choice that whatever they decide, somebody is not gonna like it. But, you know, those characters aren't gonna be antagonists, they're not gonna be villains or monsters, but it's creating more consequences that after your main character has made a decision, they have to deal with fallout. And the more choices that you can squeeze into your plotline, the better, really.
that you know you want characters to ha have to face up to problems on top of problems on top of problems and have to make decisions that have consequences that kind of all e everything will pile in on them at once and really you want to build this up and up and up right until the end of your novel when everything comes to that crunch point when they have to decide the most important decision at the end and it will have the biggest consequences and it has to be the right one and generally if you're writing a kind of commercial fiction it has to be the they have to make the right one and it has to uh, lead to a happy ending and uh, everyone has to look back on them and think oh actually they made right, made the right decision i might have disagreed with them at the time but they made the right choice and you have your happy ending so i've talked about structural issues and now i want to get more into the nitty-gritty of writing and there's no two ways of avoiding the subject but we're going to talk about voice and uh Writing magazines write endless columns about what is voice, or, you know, what, what is this? And, and it, it is a subject that uh, people will be discussing until the end of the written word. Uh, voice is this, it's a concept that has, it, it's kind of shapeless and nobody can kind of define it, but I'm gonna try. And I've got an example here that uh, for copyright reasons I'm not going to read out the original but I'm going to read out a version of this very famous book where I've stripped out voice because I think that will help you see what voice is and you might have a copy of this voice and, I, and I've chosen a very famous book uh, Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone by JK Rowling because you might have it, but if not, you can get onto Amazon or Google and you can find out what the first paragraph is. But I've rewritten the first paragraph and I've stripped out the voice. And I think that will show you what voice is. Because the first paragraph, and actually every paragraph of the 800,000 words that goes into the seven books of the Harry Potter saga, her voice is very strong, the entire length of it. But I think with that one paragraph alone, you will see what voice is when I strip it out. Mr. and Mrs. Dursley lived at number four, Privet Drive. They did not believe in magic. That is it. So what do we learn about voice from my version of that opening paragraph? I'm, I'm kind of reminded of what kind of agents say uh, when they, dis they define voice. And a lot of them say, uh, I, don't know what vo I don't know what voice is, but when I see it, I, I, you know, I, I know that it's this particular author uh, you know, with one sentence, I, I, I don't, I don't subscribe to that. Uh, I can read many authors and I wouldn't be able to tell you who wrote it. Uh, I, I don't, I don't think most writers have that distinctive a voice, but I think with voice, you need to bring out who you are. And it's, it's, it's not about kind of striking out to be really unique, that, you know, uh, looking at what everyone else is doing and then just doing the opposite because you want to be different. It's, it's not about that. It is about pouring some of who you are, your experiences and your opinions and your perspective into your writing uh, and that uniqueness comes from the fact that we all have different experiences you know we, we all come from different backgrounds we all have uh, different experiences growing up and 
you know, we all see things slightly differently, and that, to me, is at the core of voice. That it's those little details, it's, it's not the big stuff, it is the little stuff that you use to find the voice of your writing and kind of your character's perspective on the world. And, you know, we've all had this a different experience, but if you can find those little details that help you can help, you know, your writing connect with people you've never met who do not know you, and if they read your writing and think, Somebody sees things in the same way that I do. You know, I don't even know them. But here it is. In this, in, you know, I'm writing, I'm reading this novel and uh, I'm, I'm having this kind of c connection with this author. When you've done that, you, you've nailed voice. Which is easier said than done. So when you're exploring your own voice, I don't think you should be overly self-conscious about uh, finding it. Uh, it. It's not about trying to artificially create a voice for yourself. It is about, it literally is about kind of uncovering it. It is about kind of tapping into your own unique experiences and your feelings about stuff. And it can be absolutely anything. And that is the crucial point, that it is about an emotional reaction to the world around you. So one of the issues I wanted to discuss in the video was perspective, and I think this is a good point to bring that in, because it is closely connected to voice. And it doesn't matter whether you're writing in the first person or the third person, because your voice will come through either way. In the first person, uh, you know, you, you might try and project a lot of your voice onto the character and hope the reader reads that and, and sees your voice as the character's. In the third person, personally, I think it's easier that what you write through your voice, the reader will see that as kind of your perspective, but they won't, you're kind of a silent narrator. And this, is, this, is, this has been a change in fiction in the last century. Uh, if you know who read Dick, Dickens, uh, he, he sits there and he, he, he interjects at points and he kind of tells you what he wants you to think. Uh, you can't get away with that now unless you're parodying it. Uh, you have to kind of inject what you, you feel and what you think through a character. You know, you can have your proxy character, who is you, but readers are very savvy. They know, they're going to know what you're doing. They don't want to sit there being told a story. You have to let it unfold in front of them. But if we get back to perspective, uh, from a third-person perspective, that means you're not just kind of telling the reader uh, your, you know, your inner thoughts. It's not an inner monologue. You are kind of describing what is happening from a, you know, very limited perspective. And, uh, you know, lots of people write from the first person not appreciating how difficult it is. And there seems to be a kind of uh, kind of a, quite a modern uh, approach, kind of writing from the first person present tense, which is the most difficult, the most challenging voice to write from, for reasons that I won't get into in this video because it is the uh, I could write I could do a whole video about why that is the most challenging. I've tried it myself. It is it is so difficult. It is deceptively simple because you think it is, uh, it's a natural way. We all think in the first person, present tense. Avoid it as much as possible. If you have to write in that way, do it, but beware that you 
are going to face problems you m might not even have thought about up front. But that's another video. Uh, in this video, we're going to talk about voice and perspective in the third person, because uh, most books in whatever genre, in commercial fiction, and some literary fiction, will be written in the third person, limited. So when we talk about third person, uh, that doesn't mean you can't reveal how someone is feeling. On the contrary, you have to reveal what a character is thinking. And a lot of writers seem to feel that the third person is, is, is more detached than it, than it is, and it isn't. It really is very, uh, it is very involved. You've got that slight detachment, but it is not it is not as far from the first person as you th necessarily think it is. And when you are writing from the third person, you are still in somebody's head. You have a, a little bit more distance. It's not a stream of consciousness, literary monologue, but you are still doing the uh, kind of immediate thoughts that they're having that might not be accurate, that it might not be the best decisions that they can make, but they are kind of an insight into who they are, and that is, that it's so important for the reader to have, that you are giving us that glimpse into who they are. So at this point, I, I think we need, to, we need to look at the fact that every uh, plot of every novel is about a character's uh, emotional journey, and the key word there being emotional. Uh, you know, every good plot line, you know, it, it doesn't matter how, how many rooms it takes place in, a good plot could take place in a single room. It's, it's not about how far a char character travels in miles, it is about how far they travel as a human being. And they might not even be a human being. That is irrelevant. Uh, it is all about how, how much they spread from who they were at the very start. So it, when we're talking about journey, we are talking about an emotional journey. And this should inform how you write, and, and this is what perspective is about, and this is what voice is about. It is about the uh, visceral over the cerebral, and what I mean by that is uh, if your main character comes up against a situation, you are not writing about what they think about that situation, you are writing about what they feel about it. Uh, it's about the uh, the emotional reaction because that is how we connect with the right with the with the character. Uh, we don't connect with the character who takes a step back from their own existence and then kind of narrates their own life. Uh, we connect with the, with the character who is in the depth of it and just gives it to us straight. So summing that up in a nutshell, uh, what you have to focus on with voice and perspective is experience over observation. So what a character sees is not as important as what a character feels about what they see. At this point, we're gonna get into the uh, a subject that comes up in a lot of kind of creative writing classes and critiques, which is uh, those dreaded three words, show, don't, tell. And at this point I need to hide behind uh, the great Russian dramatist Anton Chekhov, who uh, kind of summed this up very well, that uh, he, he said something like, don't tell me that the rain is falling, tell me how that feels on your skin. And that fundamentally is what show and tell is about. It is not about kind of trying to force the reader to see things your way. It is about showing them 
by your character how your character sees the world and hoping that they will, having spent time with this character, see things from their perspective, if not immediately, at least sympathetically. So we, we take like show don't tell to kind of extreme. Uh, that's something I see a lot of in kind of first drafts or uh, manuscripts that writers think are not first drafts but actually read like it is that they don't see the the writing they've done that very much is telling rather than showing. And the, the, the kind of key things to look out for here are storytelling and exposition. And storytelling is probably easier to recognise when you're doing it. That's when you take a step back. So instead of having characters interact with each other, you are just kind of summarising what they are saying to each other. And it, 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 could, it could go even further back from that. So you could be summarising what characters are doing. So it ends up that you're kind of writing kind of an article about what your characters have done or are doing. And I, 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 kind of, I do find myself writing this, this comment at the bottom of pages and pages and pages and pages where kind of writers are writing in this kind of style where I think I, I write this this reads like a Wikipedia article about this scene and that's not how they intended it. They are they've intended this as a scene but they've written a summary of it because they want us to think a certain thing or they want us to feel a certain way about what's happened in the scene. So they kind of try and curate this experience for us and it, it never works never at this point I'm not gonna I'm gonna take a step back and I'm gonna look at something really kind of detailed uh, kind of something very specific that might not actually seem that important but every creative writing book and course that we will take really emphasises this thing, which is the first line. And, uh, you know, so many of them tell you the first line is the most important. And I'm going to be slightly irreverent and say the first line is not important at all. But when I say the first line is not important at all, I'm being a bit, you know, facetious. It is important, but not as important as these books and these courses kind of make out that, you know, the first line is, 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 is the be all and end all of writing. It, it really isn't. I, you know, I read so many manuscripts where uh, writers kind of throw everything at the first line and it, it kind of, it feels like they are throwing something in your face that they're just like, ooh, ooh, ooh. And it feels like narrative clickbait. That, you know, they're writing something to grab your attention as if that is the most important thing. And it really isn't. It really isn't. That if you think about it, when you go into a bookshop and you pick up a book that you have picked up, because the title is intriguing, or the cover grabs your attention. How many times have you given up after the first sentence? Probably never. Uh, the amount of readers who pick up a book in a bookshop and give up after the first sentence is minimal. The number of readers who give up after the first paragraph, or read the first page and then give up and put the book back on the shelf, that is far more significant. So uh, does that mean that the the last line in the first paragraph or the last line 
on the first page is more important than the first sentence, when the reader gets there, they will certainly think so. And that is, that is the lesson to take from this, that forget all that emphasis on that first sentence. It is not about the first sentence, it is about building that momentum, that intrigue and that interest that will keep you reading beyond the first sentence. The, you know, the first sentence is only the most important until the second sentence, and the second sentence is only the most important until the third, and the third, and, and so on. You want to build that momentum of interest, and it's not just about throwing stuff with a really impactful first sentence, and then not paying off that sentiment, that, you know, that, that, you know, what you set up. It's, if, if you throw stuff at the reader in that first sentence, you have to pay off that with the second sentence. You cannot just throw something at the reader in the first sentence and then take a step back. You can't just, you know, blow everything up in the first sentence and then go back and, and discuss everyone's mother and father and cousins and stuff like that. That, that, that doesn't work. If you, if you put an explosion in the first sentence, you have to follow it up in the second sentence with who dies in that explosion and why is that important? And that, that's the key thing that so many people focus on that first sentence and they will, they will, they, they will do a, uh, you know, an explosion in that and then afterwards they think they've got leeway to slow down and write about everyone's backstory and everyone's mother and father and uncle and an auntie. Absolutely not. That is the complete opposite of what you want to do. Whatever you do in your first sentence, you have to build on in your second sentence. So let's take things back and look at the overall picture of the things I've been saying. And so what we need is a kind of an active protagonist who has goals, maybe one goal that he finds a better one or she finds a better one. And there is conflict with that goal, that there's somebody who's trying to stop them, uh, who's got better ideas from, from their perspective. And then you get into, get into the voice of that protagonist and seeing things from their perspective uh, and you, you're showing us their perspective you're not, you're, not, you're, not, you're not telling us how they feel you're showing us how they see things and the first sentence does not matter at all and that is the most important thing that you know it's 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 not about the first sentence it's about what happens afterwards and I think if you, if you get fixated about those first paragraphs, you forget it. Uh, you know, every agent knows that you have to write a killer first line, and they'll look beyond that. They'll, you know, every everything you write, they'll expect you to rewrite anyway. So the most important thing is to create a character that a reader will connect with. Because the first reader, if you are going into this uh, process, this system, where the first reader is a literary agent, the first reader will be somebody who is a literary agent, who has got a commercial eye, but they are still looking to make a emotional connection with your character and their plight, and their goals. They want to know what your character has to lose. They want to know what what they want and why they want it. So we, we tackled some fundamental issues and uh, some quite particular issues in, in this video. And I, I don't know, 
the thing you have to bear in mind is that you know every reader is an individual so when you're submitting your work you you will never know what it is that a an agent or a publisher will like or not like about what you've written so the only thing you have any control over is whether it's true to what you are trying to do and my perspective as somebody who is first and foremost a writer even though I get paid to edit is that when I'm writing I just want to write the best version of this vision that I have in my head of what this story should be. And all commercial aspects aside, that's what you should do. Because the whole commercial side of things, it's it, it's, it's guesswork. Uh, I, I constantly have to tell uh, writers I work with about how uh, the uh, Time Traveller's Wife, how every major publisher in the entire United States rejected that book, and how it became one of the biggest selling books uh, of, of the first decade of the century with a small press. A tiny small press is one bloke at one publisher who took that on, who saw that magic. And that is the key point. That you own it all you know, writing stuff aside, you only need one person to say yes. It doesn't matter how many people have said no. You only need one person to say yes. And that's it. So you don't have to worry about them. But just don't think it. Don't think about trying to tick anyone's boxes, except your own. Uh, you've got your vision, it, it's at the writing pro stage of it, it is about meeting that vision, it is about what are your own goals, what do you want to achieve, uh, what do you want from these characters that you have created, you know, these, these fake human beings. You want to make them real. You want people to connect with them as if they were real. That is the thing to focus on. Not stuff about contracts and film deals and stuff like that. That is irrelevant. Do not think about any of that stuff. Focus on character, voice, perspective, all of that stuff. That is the most important stuff. If you focus on that stuff and you get it right, the other stuff, that'll fall into place. And that is all I have to say on the matter.